Hey everyone, it's Tracy with American SPCC. And our guest today on A Brighter Future Starts Here is Sandy Schwartz. She is a journalist and author, and she just wrote a book. It's coming out soon. It's called Finding Eco Happiness. And we're going to be discussing five steps to happiness through nature. Welcome, Sandy. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to talk about eco happiness today. Yeah, and we're excited to hear about it. It was a very interesting title. I understand that you have a background in environmental studies. Yes, I became very interested in the environment in about 10th grade during high school when I volunteered to clean up a dirty river in my home state of New Jersey. And I remember actually like boots, like picking out boots from this river, um, which was probably about 15 minutes from my home. And that really just triggered my passion to want to make a difference in the world and, and help the environment. And I went on to college to study environmental studies and got very involved in the world um, professionally in environmental communications. And then, so that's led me, um, it's also kind of then mixed to my own personal struggles with stress and anxiety. And I realized that nature can help us with that. And I know a lot of people right now are, are struggling um, and kids as well. Uh, things have been very difficult the last few years. And really this is a topic no matter what's going on in the world or someone's personal life, um, we always have stress to battle. And I think nature is a wonderful uh, solution or an enhancement to any other program that, that you have, whether it's therapy or medication. No matter yeah. what, nature can always make things better. That's such an interesting story that you were already studying environmental studies. And then all of a sudden there's this aha moment, like what are these boots doing in this beautiful river? Right. Yes. And then with your own personal journey and then just kind of tying it all in to to figure out how nature can help us with our own psychology, so to speak. Yes. And it also, you know, I was triggered. I had struggled with infertility during my um, trying to get pregnant. And then I had very challenging pregnancies. I had preterm labor and I had to get progesterone shots. It was a real <laughs> doozy for yeah, me. I yeah. had two yeah. incredible children. Um, that right. time in my life though was, was difficult. And, you know, coming out of that, I really did um, have a lot of that, you know, the, the, with the, between the hormones and the stress of that time, the anxiety was there. Um, and even though I grew up as a pretty stressed out kid, um, you know, sweaty palms in the class as the math teacher was calling on me and, and nervous to go to birthday parties. So I was uh, prone to, uh, you know, when something like that, you know, an issue like infertility really pushed me over the edge. But I came out of it and I started researching um, positive psychology. And that ultimately led me to the, the, the marriage of nature and mental health. But positive psychology is instead of kind of dwelling on all the negativity, um, you know, you think about the um, origin of talk therapy, it was a lot of like talking about your problems and how to deal with them um, and, and the root of them. And positive psychology is looking at things like gratitude mm. and awe, awe of nature and other aspects in our life, um, volunteerism, um, mindfulness and all of those components are, are a way to really build a balance in our lives every day so not just to tap into them when we're feeling stressed and anxious but something to to live our lives using so that that's where nature is a component of that of how that beautiful. Yeah. how beautiful yeah it, it sounds like when you were younger you had this social anxiety and we all have experienced social anxiety in the past two years, right? In some form or other with COVID and all of that. So why does nature actually make us feel better? Well, what's really great about this area of research is, well, first of all, we know instinctively nature makes us feel better. We just do, right? Because we know yeah. when we go, when we pick a vacation spot, we love to go sit at the, at the ocean, at the beach and, and look at, or the mountains, you know, it's just right. what we love. Right. Yeah. Right. It's just like we knew it. We've known it all along. It's been embedded in cultures for hundreds, thousands of years. 
But what's so wonderful about this area is that the scientists have now have hundreds to thousands of studies really confirming that this connection to nature really has, you know, there's proof that our cortisol levels, you know, the stress hormone in our system decreases when we go and spend some time um, amongst greenery, whether it's, um, you know, a, a walk in a park or along um, the ocean, uh, the beach. Um, so they have this data. And that's what's so incredible about it. Um, a big study came out a few years ago that really hit big. And I think it, it really changed the outlook of, of nature. And, and you've seen a lot more articles since then. But it basically said 20 minutes a day of, of being outside in nature is what we need. It's, it's our, our natural medicine to feel happier and calmer. And this is for every age. But especially it's important for kids because we know our kids, you know, I have two school age kids myself. They're sure. just not outside as much. No, they're not. Yeah. Unfortunately, they're not. Right. Recesses, PE, everything's yes. been cut short. Right. Mm -hmm. The arts, all of that kind of stuff. Um, so tell us a little bit about how you pulled all of these sciences together and you created a book, Finding Eco Happiness. Do you have, do you have that next to you? Oh, <laughs> yes. I love that. Um, okay, yeah. Good. And I, I really wanted to also just want to point out the diversity. It was very important to me that there's a lot of diversity also expressed throughout the book. Um, because, and we'll get to it later, but there are barriers um, some people face. And I think it's important that all kids and all families realize that nature is, is out there for us to access. Yeah. Well, nice. In different ways, right? Like if you don't have access yes. to it, you might have access to, you know, a park by the house or something. Just get out there, find it, right? Even your own backyard and... Even a window, even a window, uh, if you could, I'm sorry, are you getting a feedback on my? No, no feedback. I hear you perfect. Okay. Yeah, okay. even a window. You know, the. I have to tell you a, fun, a funny little story. My dad, he's 80 and all of a sudden out of nowhere, a couple of months ago, he said to me, I find earth thing very relaxing. And I said, dad, what's the earth thing? <laughs> like my 80 year old dad introduced me to earth thing. It was so funny, wow. right? So he's yes. always outside and I take off my shoes and I put my feet on the ground. This is someone who really never invoked spirituality in me my entire life. So to hear it, it was like so lovely to hear it coming from my dad. And it was so nice for me to know that he had this sense of peace but that's part of his, I guess, the way he found his eco happiness. Yes, and earthing, I, I go into that in my book because it's, it's a mindful pra practice, but it can be done on the grass or soil or the sand. And it's really, they've actually fi found a physical um, change that, you know, by connecting to the soil or the warm sand, our body just feels better. And, and, um, my daughter and I actually tried it for the first time during the beginning of the pandemic, because um, this is really cool. When we when lockdown started, I said, how am I going to deal with this? And what can I do to be to make something positive out of this crazy situation? So I challenged myself uh, the 100 day eco happiness challenge. And Every day for a hundred days consistently, I did something, sometimes alone, sometimes with my, my family, something involving nature. And even when it was pouring rain outside, we found an activity, whether it was online or, or using our window. And it was amazing. And I, I ended up boiling it down into a 30 day calendar that people can get for free on my website. But it, you know, I took kind of the highlights from that experience. So let's talk about your website for a minute. Let's just slash HTTPS ecohappinessproject.com. So I think our listeners would probably love to go to your website and download that calendar. That sounds amazing. And what a great practice. You know, what a way to get your family involved. I love that. So tell me about building a habit. Like how, what are the steps to building some kind of eco habit? 
Sure. So the first thing is to really recognize why nature is so healing. And there's, like I said, tons of research, but some little tidbits are, okay, there's something called fractal patterns, for example. This is really cool. So if you really, if you think about nature, you think of a leaf, you think of the branches of a tree, you think of the shell, the swirls of a, a shell, all of these are natural patterns that exist in nature. I mean, it's just there. It, 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 it really is incredible that we had nothing to do with it. Um, tree rings, you know, and you see the tree rings. So all these are the petals of a flower. So all these patterns are out there. And, and the scientists have found that when we see that, there's something very soothing that goes on in, you know, the connection with our eyes and our brain. And it just makes us feel good to see those patterns. So that's an example of nature just giving us a gift of relaxation. Of course, colors, um, you know, if you're into home, home decor, uh, you know, color, studying color is a really big deal as well, how it affects our mood. And so green and blue happen to be very soothing colors. In fact, blue, I, I believe, is the most popular color in the world because people just find it to be so relaxing. Um, what else? Nature sounds. I mean, I just love going for a walk in the morning and hearing the birds chirping. And, and again, the studies, they've, they've compared like human voice meditation apps to bird, just listening to bird sounds, you know, even just, you know, in your headphones. And by far, everyone feels more relaxed with the birds. So nature just, just endless resources outside the door that helped us feel better. So it's, that's the first step is re recognizing and then being mindful about it. Because you can go on your walk, you can go on a bike ride, you can visit a, a national park. But if you're busy chatting away or looking at your phone or just like daydreaming and not really soaking it in, then you're not going to reap the benefits. So that's a big, you know, something to remember is to, to really, and to teach our kids to really focus and be mindful of the nature around us. How beautiful. And I just want to revisit something from your earlier point about how blue is the most popular color. And that would make sense because our oceans are blue and our skies are blue or our oceans are reflecting the sky. That's, you know, so that would make a lot of sense to me that um, that blue would be the most popular color. And I know also in healthcare offices, it's a very soothing color. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So let's talk about the diversity and inclusion that you were also uh, mentioning earlier, right? I, th I think that kind of goes hand in hand with your third step to finding eco happiness. Yes. Oh, we got to do number two though. Um, so to look at our interests. So, so when we want to build a habit and especially with our kids, we don't want to like push them and say, Hey, let's, you know, you, if you go too far too fast, it's going to turn them off. Yeah. So I always say, you know, start with what you already love. Start with what your kids already love. Mm -hmm. If they are into art, maybe they typically are doing, you know, cartoon characters. Well, expand that a bit. Get them outside and see if they are interested in drawing, painting, um, taking nature photographs. Really, like, getting them to take those interests and applying them to a nature perspective. Um write a writer, you know, could start writing about nature poetry. An mm -hmm. athlete, you know, who maybe plays basketball inside all the time, you know, say, hey, let's go, let's go to the park and play basketball outside, or let's, you know, pick another sport that's outside or try something different. So it's really starting with what you love. And then to your point, the next step would be assessing your current resources, which also includes looking at your barriers. So how much time do you have? You know, where can you fit a nature habit activities into your schedule? Um, are there fears? Fear is a really big barrier for people. I mean, whether it's fear of animals or fear of people looking at you, you know, while you're on the trail because you look different or because you feel like you're a novice and you're not wearing what, you know, a, a typical hiker might wear. Um, so there, you know, to really assess that and then to, to figure out your comfort level, there's a great book that I used as a reference to my book 
that was all about um, getting families to hike, you know, to go hiking. And so they said, start by walking around your neighborhood, you yeah. know, take the baby steps, then yeah. go to your local park and work your way up, you know, to uh, the Grand Canyon. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, that's fantastic. Um, so then that would be the third, right? The third step. That was the third, yes. And and then what's the fourth step to finding ego happiness? So again, like once you assessed your barriers and your time, and then you want to really figure out how to build it into your life, your current lifestyle, your current schedule. And this can be such simple tweaks. Like I mentioned earlier, the research shows that just 20 minutes a day connecting to nature can make a really big difference on our mental health and our kids, our kids' lives. So it might look like having dinner outside, right? Like a few times a week. It may look like taking a walk before school or when you pick up the kids from school, um, you know, go for that walk, take a bike ride, do the homework outside. Really picking just easy steps and then maybe even setting some family goals, like sitting down and looking at your month that's coming up and, and saying, hey, like, let's look at these few weekends or a few days off of school. And what can we do to connect to nature? You know, what what's a museum or, you know, the zoo or the botanical garden we haven't visited yet or in a while? And there's so many places that are just intriguing, you know, butterfly gardens. And, yeah. and we went to an aviary in Canada. Yeah, if I... Um, uh, uh, Niagara Falls, it was in Niagara Falls, across the street from Niagara Falls. And you know, you go to Niagara Falls and you're like, oh, this is amazing, the nature. And it was a rainy day. And there was this, we saw in a magazine ad or whatever, that there was an aviary, which is an indoor area filled with birds. Mm -hmm. And from the outside, this place, we had, we were, we had very low expectations. We're like, what is in this place? <laughs> it was an, a magnificent three hours. And I have fabulous pictures from that experience. We got to hold these little birds and they, they were um, eating, uh, uh, you know, in our hands, a little nectar. We saw just so many beautiful birds. And so you can find nature indoors and it's just, it's getting a little creative, really. Yeah, thinking outside of the box. And I applaud you for finding all of these really interesting ways for people to explore nature. I love it. Okay, before you got on the show, I visited your website and there was a really neat quiz. Oh, yes. So I took the quiz and it is all about helping me explore what type of nature or where to start getting my kids involved with nature. And I thought that was a really interesting quiz. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes. I had heard that one of the most intimidating parts of getting involved with, you know, ha with nature, with your family for, for most people, right? Most people are like, well, where do I begin? You know, I'm not an environmentalist. I don't go hiking or camping. You know, where, what could I possibly do? They don't, they just, they feel like, you know, they just are clueless. And so I said, aha, well, I need to get, provide a resource that is fun. So it's a 10 question quiz. And as you can see, adults can do it and it's fun for the adult. Yeah. <laughs> I was, was written about my kids when I was taking the quiz. It, it was nice. Right. Like there's questions like what kind of, you know, the, the, and there's five choices in each question, but you know, what kind of birthday party would they prefer? What's their favorite, you know, weekend activity. And I put together like five different categories. It was like the mindful kid, the athletic kid, the adventurous kid. And so you go through this and, you, and you'll get an automatic email that, that categorizes you in one of these five areas and a whole list of act activity ideas. And so this is a great way to get started. And it really goes back to that original point of when you sit down to your family and say, hey, like, you know, I heard that nature can make us feel better. I think we should try to add this to our life a little bit more because I know, you know, you guys are stressed at school and all that. And they'll probably look at you like, what? Like, you know, I don't want to go hiking. It's like what I said, but what I was thinking when my dad said earthing, I'm like, what? Where'd, where'd that come from? But it's a great idea. It's amazing. Yeah. yeah. And there's always, there's something for everybody. 
between, and again, it could be reading books that have to do with, you know, a nature story. It could be just people who are into history, kids who love history, maybe they uh, you want to read biographies of great environmentalists. The math kid, you know, you can do math projects outside. I mean, there, it really is endless. So this quiz, I really highly recommend you go to my website and you take it. It's free. And then you'll get all kinds of free resources in your inbox. I'll get you started. Awesome. Awesome. And being that you mentioned books, that is a perfect segue for me to ask you not only about finding eco happiness, but about your new children's book coming out. Can you tell us a little bit about it? Sure. So I, I always felt that the, if you're going to educate the parents about what this all means, it will be great to have a tool to sit down with the kids as well and explain it to them. And so I worked with a teacher to co-author a book called Skies Search for Eco Happiness. And it's about a little girl who's feeling blue and down in the dumps. And her mom says, why don't you head outside and find your friends? And she ha she's a lucky little girl. She happens to live right by the beach that she can walk in walking distance to the beach. And she goes out to the beach and she finds different friends doing um, relaxing activities, connecting to nature, like yoga and painting a sunset and cleaning up the beach, doing a beach cleanup. And she realizes that, you know, what nature has to offer and, and it, it makes her feel better in the end. And so it's... Yeah, the book, uh, it's exciting. We just finished the illustrations and doing the formatting now. And my my parenting book is coming out in March and I'm, I'm hoping that the uh, the children's book will be there as well. And that, that'll be available also on Amazon. That is awesome. And once again, I just want to flash to our viewers where to find so Finding Eco Happiness. Yeah. happiness. Right, there's the book. Thank you, Sandy, for holding that up and for sharing all of this amazing, amazing, amazing information with us. Um, I was sharing with you a little bit earlier that I'm I'm out a couple of times a day because I have dogs, and what better way mm. to get outdoors than to walk the dog? So we're kind of in a routine with that, and I really enjoy it. I'd like to know if you have any final message for our listeners, our caregivers, their children. You know, nature is out there for us, right? And I think it's very important. The bottom line message is that we need to care for nature too, because we know it cares for us in a sense, right? It's helping us feel happier and calmer. So it really is our responsibility to keep it protected and clean. Because, you know, if the park, once you realize and you're having all these amazing memories with your kids at the park and you see them, feeling more relaxed. The last thing you want is for that park to be paved over. So it's important for all of us to do our part and to keep it clean, to keep it protected, to keep it there. And I think that um, that's the bottom line message of, of what I want to get, you know, across to everyone because nature, nature's there and, you know, take advantage of it in a, you know, in a, in a safe way. <laughs> that's so beautiful because you're right. You know, we're, we're receiving from nature. So why not give back to nature and make sure that it's there for the next generation and the next group and so on. That's beautiful. Thank you again, Sandy, for joining us from the ecohappinessproject.com. Definitely keep us posted. We want to hear more about you. We want to hear more about your book. <clears throat> Excuse me. So again, thanks for joining us today, Sandy. So Please, for all of our listeners and viewers, go to the American SCC.org to hear more wonderful podcasts and resources like the one you heard today. We're always bringing specialists to you that can inform and advise and just give us out of the box ideas. Also, if you know someone making an impact in your community the way that Sandy is making an impact, please feel free to contact us at American at info at americanspcc.org. We'd love to hear from them. We'd love to get them on the show. Again, thank you for joining us today. I'm Tracy Kawa. And remember, a brighter future starts here. <laughs>